Hi, this is Shiva P. Raman. Uh, I am an assistant professor of radiology at Johns Hopkins. And over the course of this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CT imaging of solid pancreatic masses. Now, we're going to begin with a very brief introduction, talking a little bit about protocol optimization, and specifically how we at Hopkins choose to image patients with a suspected pancreatic mass. But we're going to spend most of this lecture really going into two major types of pancreatic masses that I think come up most often in clinical practice. We'll start by talking about pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which I think is probably the most important and something you all should be familiar with in your day-to-day -day practices. And then we'll talk about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the prototypical hypervascular pancreatic mass. Now, for each of these lesions, we're going to talk about staging, how you can help the surgeon determine what's resectable and what's not, as well as a few mimics that potentially could look a lot like an adenocarcinoma or a neuroendocrine tumor. Now, as far as I'm concerned, having proper CT technique is absolutely critical when you're imaging a pancreatic mass. Now, not only is it going to help you in terms of identifying the lesion, but if you don't have the right technique, you're not going to be able to tell whether what that mass is. Is it an adenocarcinoma? Is it a neuroendocrine tumor? And moreover, you're really going to have trouble telling whether you're dealing with a pancreatic or a peripancreatic lesion. But once you've identified the lesion and figured out what it is, having that proper technique is critical in terms of local regional staging, identifying distant metastatic disease, and providing your clinician that critical information as to whether or not a lesion is resectable or not. Now, our standard pancreatic protocol at Hopkins is a dual phase study. So any suspected pancreatic pathology, not just a mass, but in things like pancreatitis, are going to get a dual phase study. So typically that entails an arterial phase at roughly 25 to 30 seconds, and then a venous phase at roughly 50 to 60 seconds. Now note that we do not give these patients positive oral contrast. Not only will that interfere with your 3D post-processing, which we put a lot of emphasis on at Johns Hopkins, but you can also end up with streak artifact and beam hardening artifact that I've seen examples where that artifact can actually obscure lesions in the pancreas. Rather, patients with suspected pancreatic pathology are just going to get a neutral contrast agent, either water or volumen, typically about a liter of water or volumen, including some immediately prior to the injection. Now, it is critical that you give a brisk injection of IV contrast, at least 3 to 5 cc's per second, and we give omnipake or visipake, depending on the patient's renal function. Now, why exactly do you need two phases? Now, what's the point? Why not just do a single venous phase like we do for a lot of other things? And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the arterial phase is critical in terms of differentiating vascular tumors, especially neuroendocrine tumors from pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which tends to be hypodense and most conspicuous on the venous phase. It's also important in cases of neuroendocrine tumors in terms of identifying vascular metastases. Whether it's lymph node mets or liver metastases from a neuroendocrine tumor, they are going to be most evident on the arterial phase. Now, even though arterial phase imaging is most important for neuroendocrine tumors, it is worth noting that there are rare cases where adenocarcinomas will be more conspicuous on the arterial phase, and having both of those phases together increases your odds of catching a subtle tumor. On top of that, even once you've identified the lesion, vascular mapping techniques are going to help you determine vascular tumor involvement, and that's critical for adenocarcinoma, right? The distinction between a lesion with just subtle abutment of the SMA or full 360-degree encasement of the SMA is quite significant in terms of whether or not that patient is resectable. Now, the venous phase images, of course, for pancreatic adenocarcinoma are going to be the most important. The vast majority of adenocarcinomas will be most conspicuous on the venous phase, and identifying metastatic disease, especially to the liver, and local regional lymphadenopathy, again for pancreatic adenocarcinoma, is going to be best done using the venous phase. Now, on top of that, determining a tumor's resectability will always entail looking at the portal veins and the SMV, and that's best done on the venous phase images. And of course, you're not just looking at the pancreas, right? Anytime you're looking at a CT scan, you have to evaluate all of the different solid organs of the abdomen, and that, for the most part, is going to be best done using the venous phase. Now, you've, you're going to hear many lectures talking about 3D post-processing, and I'm not going to recreate the wheel here, right? I'm not going to talk about each of these different 3D post-processing tools, but what I will say is that I think MIP imaging techniques, vascular mapping, VR, curved planar reformations, all of these have a very important role when you're dealing with pancreatic neoplasms, especially in terms of identifying subtle vascular involvement by tumor. And, and I'll show you some examples of that during the course of this lecture. Now, why don't we start by talking about what I consider the most important pancreatic neoplasm, and that's pancreatic adenocarcinoma. 
Now, this is something I see all the time, right? I'm, I work at probably the biggest pancreatic cancer referral center in the country. I see, you know, dozens of these cases every week. And I will tell you, having a systematic algorithmic approach to these cases is critical in terms of making sure you don't miss anything and that you're really picking up on those subtle abnormalities that your surgeon wants to know about. Now, pancreatic cancer is not that common, to be honest. I see a lot of it, but if you look at it overall in the country, there's about 28,000 cases each year, so it accounts for about 2% of all cancers. But that being said, it does account for 95% of all pancreatic exocrine malignancies, and it is the fourth leading cause of cancer mortality. Now, that brings up an important point, right? It's not that common, but it is one of the most leading causes of cancer mortality, and that's because of its very poor prognosis. There is a less than 5% survival at five years, and less than 20% of patients are candidates for curative surgery at the time of presentation. Now, for the most part, most pancreatic adenocarcinomas have typical features. These are hypodense tumors that are very poorly marginated. They tend to be infiltrative, and often they will infiltrate posteriorly into the retroperitoneum. These are not well-circumscribed lesions. Unlike the tumor we're going to talk about later, neuroendocrine tumors, it is going to be very difficult for an adenocarcinoma for you to draw discrete margins around the tumor. And, and in many cases, it can be very difficult to actually measure the tumor discreetly. Now, not only does this tumor infiltrate, it's often going to have a tendency to encase adjacent vasculature, and it will tend to involve the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct, obstructing both of those. Now, here's a relatively typical pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Notice that it's hypodense, it's poorly enhancing, it is relatively ill-defined and poorly marginated, and you can see that in the second image on the bottom right, it is obstructing the pancreatic duct with abrupt cutoff at the level of the mass. Now, in most cases, you're going to be able to see the lesion, but I will warn you, there are 5 to 10 percent of pancreatic cancers where you are not going to be able to find the lesion on CT. In these cases, the lesion is going to be essentially isoattenuating to the pancreatic parenchyma on both the arterial and venous phase. And in such instances, you are going to have to look for secondary signs of tumor, which is going to alert you to the presence of an occult tumor. Anytime you see a dilated pancreatic duct, especially where there's abrupt pancreatic ductal, abrupt cutoff of the pancreatic duct, Anytime you see a dilated bile duct, anytime you see atrophic upstream pancreas, you have to be worried about the possibility of an underlying tumor. In particular, I never let a dilated pancreatic duct go, especially when it's segmental or when there's abrupt cutoff of the duct. Even if I don't see a tumor, that is a tumor until proven otherwise, and that patient needs another test, which is usually going to be an endoscopic ultrasound if you can't identify the mass on CT. Now, here's a relatively classic example, right? You see a hypodense mass, but notice the abrupt cutoff of the distal common bile duct at the level of the lesion. Even if you didn't see the mass, you would have to be worried about the possibility of an occult neoplasm based on the morphology of the duct. Here's another example. Now, in this case, it is very difficult to identify the lesion itself. In fact, I don't really see a primary pancreatic mass. But notice that the pancreatic duct is dilated, and there is abrupt cutoff at the level of the pancreatic neck. It doesn't matter that I can't see the tumor. This is a tumor until proven otherwise. This patient needs to go on to get an endoscopic ultrasound. And in fact, they found that this patient had a sub-centimeter, very small pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Never let a dilated pancreatic duct go. That has to be further interrogated. Now, CT overall is an excellent modality for pancreatic cancer with sensitivities up to 96%. And certainly, we've improved uh, our ability to identify pancreatic cancer on CT largely because of improvements in scanner technology, thin collimation, better spatial and temporal resolution, and of course, our increasing use of MPRs and 3D imaging. Now, when you're putting together a pancreatic protocol, ultimately, you're trying to identify pancreatic tumors. And what does that mean? you're trying to maximize the difference in enhancement between the pancreatic tumor and the native pancreatic parenchyma. Now, in most cases, the portal venous phase is going to be the best phase for you to identify pancreatic cancer. But it is worth noting that even though we tend to mostly acquire two phases, the arterial and the venous phase, there actually isn't even, there is a third phase that you could theoretically acquire that gives you maximal pancreatic enhancement, and in theory, would give you your best odds of identifying a subtle pancreatic mass, and that's the so-called pancreatic phase. Now, here's a really nice uh, illustration from an article by Dreisen et al. in emergency radiology a couple of years ago, and you can see that 
the pancreas enhances maximally at roughly about 40 seconds after IV contrast. So just after our traditional arterial phase, but before the traditional venous phase. So if you really wanted to maximize your odds of identifying a pancreatic cancer, you probably would want to acquire that pancreatic phase. Now, we don't do that routinely in practice, largely because if you look at this article by Fletcher et al. in radiology more than a decade ago, he found that there wasn't really much of a practical difference in terms of how many pancreatic cancers you're going to catch using a portal venous phase as opposed to this quote-unquote pancreatic phase. And for that reason, we don't want to scan the patient with three or four different phases in every case. For the most part, we just acquire two phases. We get an arterial phase and we get a venous phase, and we don't routinely acquire this pancreatic phase. Now, one of the things I see all the time when I'm working with residents is that they tend to, use, they tend to try to talk about resectability in their dictation. And they say, this is a resectable tumor, this is an unresectable tumor. And I would strongly advise you against using those terms in your dictation. Resectability really is going to be variable depending on where you work, your individual surgeon, patient factors, do you have a pancreatic cancer clinic, um, and a lot of other factors that I think are difficult for us as a radiologist to really figure out just based on the CT scan. In general, I think you want to report certain features that your surgeon is going to use in order to determine whether that patient is ultimately going to be resectable or not. But I don't personally use the term resectable or unresectable in my dictations. Now, that being said, determining resectability is absolutely critical, right? If you correctly determine a lesion to be resectable, the survival after surgery is typically going to be about 15 to 20 percent at five years. Now, that's still bad, but at least it gives the patient a chance. On the other hand, if a patient is incorrectly thought to be resectable, so let's say you present data that says the patient is resectable based on the CT scan, but they find that the patient is actually unresectable at surgery because there is an occult liver met or an occult peritoneal carcinomatosis, then they've basically undergone the Whipple procedure for no reason. Survival after a Whipple procedure in a case where the tumor is incorrectly thought to be resectable is no better than chemoradiation alone. So you really want to avoid doing Whipple procedures in patients uh, who really, uh, where it wasn't indicated. Now, when you're trying to figure out whether a patient is resectable, the first step is to figure out whether or not they have metastatic disease. Pancreatic cancer, by far the most common location for metastasis, is going to be the liver. And you really have to look at the liver very, very carefully in these patients to make sure you're not missing a subtle metastasis. Local regional nodes are commonly involved, but in general, big, bulky, obviously metastatic nodes are not that common. Um, and oftentimes, we have a lot of difficulty in terms of figuring out whether a node is metastatic or not. Carcinomatosis, again, very common, but we tend to miss it quite a bit. And I'd say lung is probably going to be the fourth most common site. Now, in general, I tell our residents and fellows, don't worry so much about metastatic lymphadenopathy. Local regional nodes, for the most part, will not affect the decision as to whether the patient goes to surgery or not. The only things you do need to worry about are whether there's distant lymphadenopathy, so well away from the pancreatic bed, or alternatively, local regional nodes that are extensive, big, bulky, centrally necrotic. Those kind of nodes can potentially affect a patient's resectability. Now, unfortunately, as with many other types of tumors, the sensitivity of CT for metastatic nodes is pretty low, right? We're ultimately going to be looking at size criteria, which are inherently limited in terms of the sensitivity and specificity, but I wouldn't worry too much. Whether or not you call the nodes metastatic or not isn't going to matter. Most of the time, these nodes are going to be generally sampled and resected at surgery. Now, lymphadenopathy doesn't matter so much. Distant metastatic disease is critical. As I mentioned, distant metastatic disease automatically will make the patient unresectable. So if you have a liver metastasis, you have obvious signs of carcinomatosis, that patient is not going to go to the operating room. Now, the venous phase images are absolutely critical in terms of determining the presence of metastatic disease, especially to the liver. Remember, the portal venous phase gives you maximal enhancement of the liver and is going to be the best phase to identify these subtle, hypodense liver mets. Now, you're not just looking for big, obvious two or three centimeter mets. You really need to look carefully for these subtle, sub-centimeter lesions that could potentially represent metastatic disease. Now, even though the venous phase is going to be the best for identifying subtle liver mets, I do recommend that you look at the arterial phase as well. These small lesions often can be difficult to distinguish from a small cyst or a small hemangioma, but the presence of a perfusion anomaly or a THAD surrounding the liver lesion on the arterial phase can be a strong clue that you're dealing with something malignant rather than benign.
Now, as with other malignancies that metastasize to the liver, CT is quite good for lesions that are over a centimeter with sensitivities well over 90%, but the sensitivity and specificity drops quite rapidly for lesions that are sub-centimeter. And unfortunately for sub-centimeter lesions, sometimes you're going to be stuck saying that it's too small to characterize, and you may need to just follow those lesions over time or get an MRI if there's a very strong clinical suspicion. Now, as, many, as much pr as we have problems with liver metastases, we have a lot of problem identify problems identifying carcinomatosis. Our sensitivity, if you look not just for pancreatic cancer, but for a number of malignancies, is the sensitivity is probably well under 50 percent, probably closer to about 25 percent. Unfortunately, even in cases where there are macroscopic tumor implants, they can blend in with adjacent anatomy, and I've seen plenty of cases where, in retrospect, you can identify the, the carcinomatosis, but it was very difficult to identify prospectively. Unfortunately, I'd say in terms of things that we don't catch on CT that lead to a patient being determined as being thought to be unresectable at surgery, I'd say missed carcinomatosis is probably going to be the most common, and this is something that you can't avoid. We're all going to miss carcinomatosis. Sometimes you're just not going to be able to see it on the CT scan. So here's a patient who has a big pancreatic cancer in the pancreatic head. Notice that there are multiple hypodense metastases throughout the liver. Clearly, this patient is unresectable. There's no question here of going to surgery. This patient is going to get chemotherapy, and it's going to have a dismal prognosis. Now, as I mentioned, carcinomatosis can be quite difficult, and you've got to be on the lookout for pretty subtle findings. Anytime I see ascites in a patient with pancreatic cancer, I'm going to spend extra time looking at the omentum and the mesentery. Ascites has to be taken as your number one clue that there's something going on in the peritoneum, and you need to look carefully for any stippling, any nodularity, any unexplained stranding or induration in the omentum that could reflect the presence of an underlying pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Now, once you've determined the presence or absence of metastatic disease, the next step is to identify the presence or absence of vascular involvement. Now, as I mentioned before, it can be very difficult determining whether a patient is resectable or unresectable from the perspective of a radiologist. And that's largely because now there's very, there's blurred margins between what truly is resectable and unresectable. Now, in the old days, if you had really any vascular involvement at all, you were pretty much determined to be unresectable, right? There's no question as to if you had subtle SMA involvement or subtle celiac artery involvement. Essentially, those patients were not going to the operating room. Now, on the other hand, over the course of the last decade, we've now seen this new category of so-called borderline resectable disease. So these are patients who have some degree of vascular involvement, in some cases, pretty significant vascular involvement. So, and they're still potentially operative candidates, usually after a round of chemotherapy and radiation. Now, the definition of borderline resectable will vary a little bit from surgeon to surgeon, from institution to institution. But this slide really lists kind of the classic definition of borderline resectable. So you are potentially still a candidate for surgery if you have tumor that abuts less than 180 degrees of the SMA, if you have short segment encasement or abutment of the hepatic artery, or even if you have very significant SMV or portal vein involvement that's amenable to surgical reconstruction, often with some kind of a jump graft. Now, again, that gets into a level of complication that I don't think you should think about too much when you're actually dictating these cases. Your job as a radiologist is really to present the data and allow the surgeons, allow the oncologists to determine whether or not they want to take the patient to the operating room. But I will say the information that they need really hinges on five, five, uh, five vessels. You need to report in every case what the tumor is doing or the relationship of the tumor with the portal vein, the SMV, the portal SMV confluence, the celiac trunk, the hepatic artery, and the SMA. That's what the surgeon needs to know. They want to know, are those vessels involved? And if they are, to what degree? Now, when you're talking about the arteries, you want to report in terms of degrees of involvement. So you're trying to differentiate those tumors that have less than 180 degree involvement of the artery circumference from those that have over 180 degrees of an artery circumference. So in order to clear a vessel, you're looking for a preserved fat plane around the margin of the artery. Now, when you're reporting involvement of the portal vein in the SMV, I tend not to use that degree nomenclature like I do for the arteries. Now, for the portal vein SMV, you really want to give some kind of a verbal descriptor that the surgeon can use to determine whether or not venous reconstruction is technically feasible. Because as I mentioned earlier, venous involvement nowadays isn't quite as much of a barrier to uh, surgical resection because the surgeons can really 
do a lot of things in terms of dealing with the vessel, jump grafts and other reconstruction techniques. So vascular and venous involvement isn't quite as a big a deal. Here's a good example of a patient who has significant venous involvement. You can see that there's about a three to four centimeter segment of the SMV that's quite narrowed all the way up to the uh, portal SMV confluence. Here's another example. Again, you can see that there's a hypodense tumor in the pancreatic head and neck, and there is significant stenosis, not only of the distal main portal vein and confluence, but the superior SMV as well. Give a verbal description and let the uh, surgeon decide whether or not the patient is resectable. Now, arterial involvement, again, you want to be more exact. Here's a patient who has encasement of the celiac artery, so my dictation would say that there is 360 degree encasement of the celiac, and there is clearly some involvement of the hepatic artery as well. Here's another example. SMA, you can see that there's 360 degree encasement of the SMA over a relatively long segment. The vessel looks attenuated and narrowed. Now, even though we're operating on more and more patients nowadays, there's virtually no surgeon I know of who's going to operate on a patient with 360 degree SMA involvement like this. This is almost certainly going to be unresectable. Now, it's important to remember that the other vessels don't really matter so much, okay? So you're really concentrating on those five vessels that I talked about earlier, and smaller vessels like the GDA, well, that's not a big deal. Here's an example where the GDA is actually encased by tumor, but that doesn't matter. The GDA is going to come out as part of the surgery. This is not going to preclude the patient from getting resected. Now, how good is CT ultimately in terms of determining whether a pancreatic cancer is resectable or not? And the answer is that CT is actually quite good for establishing unresectability. So based on a CT scan, I can tell you with a very high degree of certainty that a patient should not go to the operating room. So the positive predictive value for unresectability may be as high as 100%. The problem is that what you're really trying to figure out is whether or not that patient is resectable. So you're trying to figure out and tell the surgeon, is that patient ultimately capable of undergoing an R0 resection? So in other words, a resection with negative surgical margins. The problem is that we still struggle with this, even with the latest generation of CT scanners. Somewhere between 60 to 91, only 60 to 91 percent of patients, or 60 to 91 percent of patients who are deemed to be resectable based on CT are ultimately found to be unresectable at surgery, and only a quarter of patients deemed to be resectable are found to be resectable at surgery. And what are we missing? We're missing small liver metastases, we're missing subtle vascular involvement, and we're missing tiny peritoneal implants. Now, I talked earlier about some of the typical features of pancreatic cancer. What are some features on a CT scan that should suggest the presence of a diagnosis other than pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So in other words, what are some features that should suggest that you're dealing with a mimic of pancreatic cancer? First of all, as I mentioned earlier, pancreatic cancer will almost always obstruct the ducts. So if I see a tumor in the pancreatic head that is not obstructing the common duct or the pancreatic duct, I'm going to look at it with a little bit of cynicism, right? Am I dealing with something else that's potentially mimicking a pancreatic cancer? Similarly, if I see a big mass in the pancreatic head, but the upstream pancreas is not atrophic, again, that is a quite atypical feature and should make you think of another diagnosis. Remember, pancreatic cancer will tend to surround vessels and often will tend to encase and narrow those vessels. So if I see a big mass that's encasing the portal vein in the SMV, but there's really no narrowing, there's no occlusion or attenuation of the vessel, that should suggest another diagnosis. And then finally, pancreatic cancer commonly metastasizes to lymph nodes, but it is relatively uncommon for you to see big, bulky local regional nodes. If you do see that, you see massive lymphadenopathy, you should think about another diagnosis, and usually that's going to be lymphoma. So what are some of the mimics that you need to be thinking about in your day-to-day -day practice? I'd say the big ones are going to be lymphoma, focal autoimmune pancreatitis, peripancreatic lymphadenopathy from another primary, duodenal, uh, uh, duodenal tumors, groove pancreatitis, and fatty infiltration of the pancreatic head. Now, of all of these, the one, of the, the one diagnosis that I'd say comes up all the time, and we get cases referred in from outside institutions with quote-unquote pancreatic cancer, and it turns out to be fatty infiltration of the pancreatic head, a.k.a. pancreatic lipomatosis. I can't tell you how many cases I've seen that were billed as being a pancreatic cancer, but that just turned out to be focal fat. Now, in most cases, fatty infiltration of the pancreas will be diffuse, but it can rarely be focal, and it tends to have a predilection for the anterior aspect of the pancreatic head. And I've seen cases where, you know, even someone like me who sees a lot of this on a day-to-day -day basis, I've been uncertain as to whether or not I was dealing with a primary pancreatic mass.
But there are some features that should make you think that you're dealing with fatty infiltration. First of all, it tends to have very geographic margins. It's going to involve the anterior aspect of the pancreatic head, and there's going to be a straight line demarcating that hypodense part of the pancreas from the more normal appearing pancreatic parenchyma posteriorly. On top of that, it's not going to act like a tumor. You're not going to see mass effect, there's no dilated ducts, there's no deformity of the pancreatic contour, it's not going to do anything to the surrounding vessels. Now I'd say in most cases, if you think about the possibility of fatty infiltration, this is not going to be a difficult diagnosis, but in those rare instances where you're truly not certain, just go on to get an MRI. An MR with in and out of phase chemical shift imaging is going to make this very easy to diagnose. The area of fatty infiltration is going to lose signal on the out of phase. Here's a good example. You can see that there is superficially something that looks like a hypodense lesion in the pancreatic head, but it's geographically marginated. There's a straight line separating the hypodense area from the posterior aspect of the pancreatic head. There's no mass effect, no dilated ducts. And the more you look at it, the more you realize it doesn't really look mass-like. This is classic fatty infiltration. Now, I'd say the second most common mimic that I see in my practice is going to be lymphoma. Now, it is worth noting that pa primary pancreatic lymphoma is actually really rare. It's less than 1% of all pancreatic tumors. Usually it's diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and you're going to see it in immunocompromised patients or the extreme elderly. And honestly, it's so rare that I've seen very few cases of it. In fact, I think I've seen one case that was truly thought to be a primary pancreatic lymphoma. Now, secondary lymphoma disinvolvement of the pancreas, on the other hand, tends to be much more common, right? And this is actually not that uncommon, at least in my practice. And I have a handful of cases that I've seen just over the last year. Now, lymphoma can superficially look like a pancreatic cancer. It's going to be hypodense, poorly marginated. It's going to look relatively poorly enhancing. And it, it does have a tendency to involve the pancreatic head. But um, there are some features that should make you think of something else. First of all, it will often surround vessels, but there's going to be absolutely no vascular narrowing, no evidence of occlusion it's not going to really ever narrow or attenuate the vessel. Secondly, unlike pancreatic cancer, which almost always infiltrates posteriorly into the retroperitoneum, lymphoma will infiltrate without any regard to anatomic boundaries. So it can infiltrate both anteriorly and posteriorly, which is quite uncommon. And then finally, as I mentioned before, pancreatic cancer is almost always associated with, with is all, often will metastasize to lymph nodes, but massive lymphadenopathy is uncommon, whereas with lymphoma, big-time lymphadenopathy is going to be very common. So here's an example. Here's a patient with a big mass that's encasing nearly the, that's surrounding the entire pancreas. Easy to think that this is pancreatic cancer, but it doesn't look like any pancreatic cancer I've ever seen, right? It is involving multiple different organs. It's encasing vessels, but notice how the SMA and the splenic artery are absolutely going through, these, uh, through this tumor unimpeded, unattenuated. There's massive lymphadenopathy. There's a big splenic mass. This is not a pancreatic cancer. This is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, it is worth noting that leukemia in its focal form, so-called chloroma or granulocytic sarcoma, can look identical to lymphoma. And you can rarely end up with leukemic infiltration of the pancreas. Here's an example of that. Big hypodense mass in the pancreatic body tail, potty slash tail segment. This turned out to be a chloroma. Now, another diagnosis that I'm increasingly seeing in my practice, or at least that we're becoming increasingly cognizant of, is autoimmune pancreatitis. Now, autoimmune pancreatitis usually is going to diffusely involve the pancreas, right? The pancreas is going to be diffusely enlarged. You're often going to see a low attenuation halo around the pancreas. You may see delayed enhancement of that halo. And often there's associated autoimmune IgG4-related cholangitis. So you may see strictures of the CBD usually with thickening and enhancement of the distal CBD at the level of the ampulla. The problem is that autoimmune pancreatitis can rarely be focal. It can involve portions of the pancreas, especially the head, and can look very much like a pancreatic cancer. Here's an example. Mass in the pancreatic head. Notice that it's not obstructing the pancreatic or the common bile duct, so that's the feature that should make you think that you're probably not dealing with a pancreatic cancer. But to be honest, in cases like this where you have a very focal form of autoimmune pancreatitis, it can be virtually impossible to really exclude the presence of an underlying malignancy. Now, here's another entity that I think many people are not familiar with but can theoretically mimic pancreatic cancer, and that's groove pancreatitis. Now, this is a rare form of chronic pancreatitis that's going to affect the pancreatic or duodenal groove, the space between the pancreatic head, the duodenum, and the common bile duct. Now, this is a rare entity. 
extraordinarily difficult in terms of making the diagnosis based on imaging, and is usually, a, you know, you most often seen in, in, in patients who have other um, risk factors for chronic pancreatitis, especially alcoholism. Now, the imaging features can look a lot like pancreatic cancer, but there are some features that may at least make you think about this diagnosis prospectively. You're looking for sheet-like, curvilinear, hypodense soft tissue in the pancreatic or duodenal groove, usually with smooth, tapered narrowing of the distal CBD in the pancreatic duct, but no stigmata of traditional edematous pancreatitis. You're not going to see inflammatory change. You're not going to see free fluid. It's going to look kind of like sheet-like tumor. Now, over time, these patients do have the traditional risk factors for chronic pancreatitis, so they will develop the traditional stigmata, including calcifications, dilated pancreatic duct, beating, and irregularity. Here's an example. You can see that there's this sheet-like curvilinear soft tissue in the pancreatic duodenal groove. It is mildly obstructing the pancreatic and common bile ducts. Very hard to say that that's not a pancreatic or a duodenal malignancy. Here's another example, again, subtle soft tissue in the groove between the pancreas and the duodenum. There is some subtle cystic change within that soft tissue, which is not uncommon uh, in these cases, but honestly, very difficult to say that that's not malignancy. Most of the cases of groove pancreatitis that I've seen have ultimately been operated on because it's very difficult to exclude the presence of an underlying malignancy, even with a negative biopsy. Now, why don't we move on now to our second major category of pancreatic masses, and we'll talk a little bit about neuroendocrine tumors. These have a number of different names. Often, many of you probably are familiar with the term islet cell tumor. I think we typically use the term neuroendocrine tumor nowadays. And these are tumors composed of well-differentiated endocrine cells. In the old days, we categorized these as being either functioning or non-functioning. But now we recognize that all neuroendocrine tumors are hormonally active, and so we tend to categorize them as being syndromic or non-syndromic based on whether they secrete enough hormone to cause laboratory and clinical findings. Now, there are a number of associations of neuroendocrine tumors with different syndromes. I'd say the most common that I come across in my practice are von Hippel-Lindau, neurofibromatosis, and MEN type 1. There's also a theoretical association with tuberous sclerosis. Now, syndromic NETs, or neuroendocrine tumors, are clinically evident lesions because the mass is producing enough hormone to actually cause an endocrinopathy. Now, because these lesions are causing symptoms, they tend to present when smaller. Now, even though we tend to think of these as just secreting one hormone, it's worth noting that syndromic NETs will often secrete multiple hormones, but it's the dominant hormone that's actually going to establish the patient's syndrome. Now, because these patients do tend to present earlier, the lesions tend to be smaller, so most often under three centimeters in size. They, there are a number of different syndromic NETs that have been described, insulinomas, glucagonomas, gastronomas, VIPomas, somatostatinomas, and so on and so forth, but the two most common types by far in our practice are insulinomas and gastronomas. Now, insulinomas tend to be small, and they tend to be relatively benign. Only 10 percent are malignant. They're associated with a classic syndrome. Uh, clinical symptoms of Whipple's triad, hypoglycemia, symptomatic hypoglycemia, and symptom improvement after the administration of glucose. Now, gastronomas, on the other hand, are much more often malignant. About 30 percent will present with liver metastases. They're often multiple, and they are not uncommonly extrapancreatic. So not only do they arise in the pancreas, they can arise in the so-called gastronoma triangle. Now, these patients will often end up with peptic ulcer disease, ulcers in unusual locations, especially post-bulbar uh, duodenal ulcers, and they can present with so-called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Now, non-syndromic NETs, on the other hand, account for about 50 percent of all neuroendocrine tumors, and because they're not producing endocrinopathy and symptoms when smaller, they tend to be quite large when they present, and so the average size is about 5 centimeters. Now, the symptoms in these patients tend to eventually occur when the lesion gets large enough and you end up with mass effect, metastatic disease, and local invasion. Now, these tumors tend to look ugly and aggressive, right? So they are much more likely to be cystic, necrotic, they can have calcification, and they can just generally look aggressive with the pre presence of distant metastatic disease. Now, how do I tell whether a lesion is a neuroendocrine tumor or a pancreatic cancer? And the truth is that in most cases, it's going to be pretty obvious. First of all, 
neuroendocrine tumors will avidly enhance on the arterial phase, and they'll typically still be hypervascular on the venous phase as well. And that's something you're never going to see with an adenocarcinoma, which is going to be hypodense on all phases. Now, the arterial phase is going to be the most critical for identifying most pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but it is worth noting that in rare instances, you will see NETs that are more conspicuous on the venous phase. But I'd say as important as the enhancement pattern is, the degree of the margins of the tumor are just as important for, identify, for the, making the diagnosis. In most cases, even if I don't have an arterial phase, just the margins of the mass on the venous phase will tell me whether I'm dealing with an adenocarcinoma or a neuroendocrine tumor. Adenocarcinomas are poorly marginated and ill-defined, often very difficult to discreetly measure. Neuroendocrine tumors are well-circumscribed lesions. They have clear margins. You're going to be able to see on what, uh, you're going to be able to clearly demarcate what's tumor and what's the adjacent peripancreatic fat. Now, these lesions can rarely be cystic or necrotic, and in fact, they can be so cystic that they can mimic other primary cystic lesions of the pancreas, like an IPMN. But in those cases where there's a significant cystic or necrotic component, there's almost always going to be a surrounding rim of hypervascular soft tissue, which should allow you to make the right diagnosis. Now, unlike a pancreatic cancer or pancreatic adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors, you typically will not obstruct either the pancreatic or biliary ducts. Now, that being said, large tumors can cause obstruction, and there is a small category of neuroendocrine tumors that, even though they're quite small, will secrete serotonin and other similar hormones that can cause fibrotic stricturing of the ducts. So even though most cases you're not going to see biliary pancreatic ductal obstruction, it can happen. You're almost never going to see upstream pancreatic atrophy, and it is not uncommon for you to see big, bulky local regional nodes, and those nodes are often going to be hypervascular on the arterial phase. So here's a chart really comparing and contrasting the imaging features of a neuroendocrine tumor and an adenocarcinoma. Remember, neuroendocrine tumors are well circumscribed, unlike the poorly marginated adenocarcinoma. In most cases, they are avidly enhancing and will be best seen on the arterial phase, unlike adenocarcinomas, which are hypovascular and best seen on the venous phase. Neuroendocrine tumors, interestingly, will invade the venous vasculature. So if you see a mass in the pancreas that's invading the SMV or the portal vein, that is almost never going to be a pancreatic adenocarcinoma and is usually going to represent a neuroendocrine tumor. Adenocarcinomas, on the other hand, will encase and narrow the mesenteric veins. Now, adenocarcinomas almost never calcify. In fact, virtually never calcify in the absence of treatment, whereas neuroendocrine tumors commonly calcify, and that calcification can be either central or diffuse. Now, as I mentioned, pancreatic adenocarcinoma will typically not give you big, bulky local regional nodes, whereas neuroendocrine tumors will often give you enlarged local regional lymphadenopathy. And of course, the metastatic disease is going to have the same enhancement pattern as the primary. So neuroendocrine metastases are going to be hypervascular and best seen in the arterial phase. Adenocarcinoma metastases are going to be hypovascular and best seen on the venous phase. So here's a classic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor well-circumscribed, well-marginated. You can clearly demarcate the mass from the adjacent peripancreatic fat, and notice that it is avidly hypervascular on these arterial phase images. Notice also there is absolutely no upstream pancreatic atrophy, which would be quite unusual for a pancreatic cancer in this, uh, adenocarcinoma in this location. Now, we are increasingly, as we do more and more arterial phase imaging for a number of different indications, identifying small neuroendocrine tumors incidentally. Here's an example of that. This is a small and neuroendocrine tumor, probably six or seven millimeters, completely incidental finding in a patient who's being scanned, I think, for looking for a renal mass. Here's another example. Again, a very small hypervascular lesion. Here's an example really illustrating that you still have to look for hypervascular lesions in the pancreas, even on the venous phase. Although they're typically most evident on the arterial phase, there are examples like this one where you're going to be able to make the diagnosis on the venous phase images as well. Now, as I mentioned, non-syndromic neuroendocrine tumors tend to be quite large. They look more aggressive, more likely to have cystic and necrotic change. Here's a big non-syndromic neuroendocrine tumor. Patient didn't have any evidence of endocrinopathy, but they ultimately came to clinical attention because of local mass effect and invasion from the tumor. Now, one of the things I'm always thinking about when I'm dealing with a pancreatic cystic lesion is, am I missing one of those rare cystic neuroendocrine tumors? Here's three examples. Now, in each of these three cases, I think it would be very easy to just say, well, okay, it's a small cyst in the pancreas. It's probably a small side branch IPMN. Who cares? Move on to the next case. But 
in each of these three cases, you'd be missing a quite significant diagnosis. Notice that these are not simple cysts. There is a rim of dense, irregular enhancement and soft tissue surrounding the margins of each of these cysts. Notice that the lesion in the bottom uh, image actually has a large soft tissue component that's hypervascular. Anytime you see a hypervascular rim or soft tissue associated with a pancreatic cyst, you have to think about a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. Now, sometimes rather than just seeing a cyst, you're going to see actual necrotic degeneration. It tends to be more common with non-syndromic lesions, but can occur in syndromic lesions as well. Here's an example where you see there's a significant necrotic component, but again, that hypervascular soft tissue associated with the lesion is going to drive you towards the right diagnosis. Now, one of the things I always tell our residents and fellows, if you see a calcified pancreatic mass, you are not dealing with an adenocarcinoma, period. Never happens. On the other hand, this is quite common with neuroendocrine tumors. These calcifications in certain instances can be very diffuse, as in this case, but or can be stippled and involve just a part of the lesion. But anytime you see a calcified solid pancreatic mass, you have to be thinking about a neuroendocrine tumor. Now, look for other signs as well. Here's a case where I actually didn't at first see the pancreatic lesion, right? And if you look at the bottom image, it's quite subtle. Even on arterial venous phase, you can kind of vaguely see that there's something there in the pancreas. But notice that there's this dramatic wall thickening of the stomach, right? It's involving the proximal and mid portions of the stomach, and that wall thickening of the stomach actually looks dramatically hypervascular. This is the classic distribution and the classic appearance of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. The second I saw that, I went back and looked at the pancreas much more carefully, and we were able to identify this very subtle pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Um, that I think I wouldn't have seen if I hadn't seen the gastric findings first. Now, as I mentioned earlier, pancreatic cancers will tend to encase and narrow or even occlude the mesenteric vasculature. That doesn't tend to happen with neuroendocrine tumors. They tend to invade the mesenteric veins. Here's an example where you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreatic tail. It's invading and distending the entire splenic vein with tumor. You know that this isn't a pancreatic cancer. They don't do that. This has to be a neuroendocrine tumor. Here's another example. Again, you can see this large mass involving much of the pancreas. It's invading the portal vein and the, S and the splenic vein, distending those vessels. And notice on the uh, coronal MIP arterial phase reconstruction, there's dramatic hypervascularity within the, uh, within the tumor thrombus, the classic neuroendocrine tumor. Now, as I mentioned, metastatic disease, either from a neuroendocrine tumor or an adenocarcinoma, will have the same enhancement pattern as a primary tumor. Here's a patient who has a big hypervascular pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Notice that the liver, metastases look, liver metastasis looks virtually identical and has lots of internal neovascularity. Now, neuroendocrine tumor liver mets can be quite small. They can be miliary in terms of their appearance. They can look sub-centimeter. And this is one of the reasons why I really think MIP imaging is critical. I always use MIPS to look at the liver in any patient with a hypervascular primary. It can really make those subtle, small, early neuroendocrine tumor uh, metastases stand out and become much more obvious. Now, just as we talked about a few mimics for pancreatic adenocarcinoma, there are several mimics of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I'd say the most common mimic, and the one that comes up actually relatively frequently in my own practice, is metastatic disease to the pancreas, and classically, renal cell carcinoma. Now, renal cell carcinoma can metastasize to the pancreas years after initial presentation, and because these are, again, fundamentally hypervascular tumors, especially with clear cell RCCs, a hypervascular met to the pancreas from an RCC will look indistinguishable from a neuroendocrine tumor based on the imaging alone. And so what's going to drive you towards the right diagnosis is going to be the patient's history. Here are two examples. The first in the upper left is just a small hypervascular lesion, could easily be a neuroendocrine tumor. And the second is a more dramatic case in the bottom right where there are innumerable hypervascular lesions throughout the pancreas. Now, in both instances, if you were to tell me these are neuroendocrine tumor uh, lesions, I would believe you, right? That's all comers going to be the most common, um, uh, common diagnosis. But what's the clue here on each of these images that that's not the right diagnosis? notice that the kidney is missing. The right kidney is missing in both cases. This patient has had a nephrectomy. These are renal cell carcinoma metastatic lesions. Now, the second mimic, and the one that I'm always worried about mistaking for a neuroendocrine tumor, is an intrapancreatic splenule. I've worked at three institutions, and at every institution I've been at, I've seen a case where an intrapancreatic splenule has been taken to the operating room um, because it was mistaken for a neuroendocrine tumor. This is this is, believe me, this is actually easy, this is an easier mistake to make than you'd think. After all, 
The pancreatic tail is the second most common location for an accessory spleen, and especially when you're dealing with just a single venous phase abdomen, very easily confused for a neuroendocrine tumor. But that being said, there are a few clues that may help you. Remember that an intrapancreatic splenule should have identical enhancement to the spleen on all phases of contrast, so it'll have that characteristic tiger stripe pattern on the arterial phase. And a neuroendocrine tumor, a, a, a splenule will never be more than three centimeters medial from the pancreatic tail. So if you see a lesion that's more than three centimeters medial from the tail, you're dealing with a neuroendocrine tumor. You're not dealing with a splenule. Now, I would say the key to making this diagnosis is to just think about the diagnosis, okay? When you make this mistake, it's usually because you don't even consider the possibility of a splenule. If you're not sure, this is one of those instances where you've got to get another test. Get a sulfur colloid TEC-99 scan or a heat-denatured RBC scan just to make absolutely certain that you're not sending the patient to the operating room for what is fundamentally a benign lesion. Here are two examples, and I'll tell you, one of these, uh, both of these lesions uh, are accessory spleens. One of them ended up going to the operating room and was unfortunately found to be an accessory spleen in the OR, but was thought to be a neuroendocrine tumor. But you can see in both instances, if you had thought about the possibility, this is a major mistake that you might have been able to avoid. So just think about it, and if you've thought about it, you're probably going to be able to recommend the next best appropriate step. Now, there are some more rare lesions that can mimic a neuroendocrine tumor as well. Here's a relatively uncommon lesion, a solid serous cystadenoma. Now, you are all familiar with the classic serous cystadenomas, which are honeycomb lesions, multiple small cystic spaces. They have a central scar, a central calcification. But there are cases where serous cystadenomas can have virtually no cystic component and can look solid, so-called serous adenomas. And they are hypervascular lesions that will avidly enhance and look identical to a neuroendocrine tumor. This is a virtually impossible diagnosis to make on CT, and frankly, I'd say that if you read enough of these, you're ultimately going to make this mistake, right? These lesions almost always are resected. Um, there's really no way around uh, making this mistake. What about peripancreatic GI stromal tumors? Now, GI stromal tumors can be found anywhere in the GI tract tend to be more common in the stomach, but when you do see them in the small bowel, they tend to be most common in the second portion of the duodenum. Now, GI stromal tumors can be very variable in terms of their enhancement pattern, but they can be relatively hypervascular on the arterial phase, and they can look a lot like a neuroendocrine tumor. Now, the key to making the right diagnosis in these cases is to look for a fat plane between the mass and the pancreatic head. So in other words, figuring out that you're dealing with a peripancreatic lesion rather than a primary pancreatic lesion. But that being said, you know, if you're not certain, it doesn't really matter. The treatment's going to be the same regardless of whether it's a neuroendocrine tumor or a GI stromal tumor. The same surgery is going to happen. It's going to be a Whipple procedure. It's not going to be critical that you make the correct di you correctly identify a differentiated gist from, uh, from a neuroendocrine tumor. Finally, here's another peripancreatic lesion that can look a lot like a neuroendocrine tumor, peripancreatic paragangliomas. Again, it's great if you're able to figure out that these are extrapancreatic and you're able to identify that fat plane between the pancreas and the mass. But once again, these are surgical lesions. Even if you're not able to make the diagnosis prospectively, as long as you're able to point the surgeon in the right direction and say that this is a lesion that needs to come out, you've done your job. Now, when you're talking about pancreatic NETs, I'd say in most cases, it doesn't matter whether you're able to differentiate one of these mimics from an NET because the treatment's going to be the same. All of them are going to get the same surgical procedure, so accurate preoperative diagnosis isn't really going to change management. But the one diagnosis you cannot miss, the one diagnosis that is really going to make you look bad in front of your referring surgeons is going to be when you misdiagnose a splenule as an NET. So anytime you see a neuroendocrine tumor near the tail or what you think is a neuroendocrine tumor, sit back at least for a minute, think about the possibility that it could be a splenule, and decide whether or not you want to get a nuclear medicine study for confirmation. So in, in summary, I, I, hopefully I've shown you that it doesn't matter how good you are, how much you know about the pancreas, if you don't have the right protocols in place, if you're not using dual phase technique, it can be very difficult to make the correct diagnosis and really give the surgeon the information they need to determine whether a lesion should come out or not. I think it's pretty much mandatory nowadays that any pancreatic imaging, regardless of what suspected pancreatic diagnosis you're looking at, requires dual phase technique with both arterial and venous phase imaging. Secondly, when you're looking at these cases, I think it's really important that you understand the role of CT in terms of both diagnosing and staging pancreatic cancer. You know, it's not enough when you're looking at a pancreatic cancer a case to just say to your surgeon, well, there is a cancer there, 
period, right? You have to give your clinician the information that they need in order to determine whether that lesion is resectable or not. Always be thinking about mimics, right? Because a lot of these mimics are not going to be surgically treated. If you have lymphoma or autoimmune pancreatitis, those are potentially non-surgical cases, and it's great if you're able to make the diagnosis prospectively and save the patient in unneeded surgery. Finally, always look at the pancreas very carefully in the arterial phase images for small hypervascular lesions. The arterial phase is the most critical phase for diagnosing pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and we're increasingly identifying these lesions on dual-phase studies being done for other reasons. So why don't we end there, and uh, thanks, all for, thanks everyone for listening.